picking up with where we left off in the Dream of the Rood, which I believe was right at line 90. I want to back up to where that sentence actually begins. 87. Once I was made into the worst of torments, most hateful to all people, before I opened the true way of life for speech bearers, lo, the king of glory, guardian of, a, of heaven's kingdom, honored me over all the trees of the forest. And then we get a simile. Just as he has also, almighty God, honored his mother, Mary herself, above all womankind, for the sake of all men. Men, not men. Um, why does the cross mention Mary? How does oh, the quote unquote the story of the birth, birth of Christ begin? With the Annunciation. Gabriel comes to Mary and says, opening words, if you're Catholic, you know this. Anybody know? Hail Mary, full of grace. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And she's like, I'm not pregnant yet. What are you talking about? And he goes on to explain what's going to happen. The, the cross kind of emphasizes this. Okay? He honored me over all the trees of the earth, just as he honored Mary over all women of the earth. Mary then responds with this big, long poem that's called the Magnificat. Okay? You can look it up. I didn't have time to write it down. So, he then goes on. So, he, 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 the first third of the poem, let's say, maybe a little bit more than half, is all history. This is what happened. Then the tree says, now, with that passage beginning line 78... Da, 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 da. That passage essentially ends with 94. Okay, so it's bringing us up to the present. And then the cross addresses the speaker and tells him something to do. That is, the cross gives the speaker a charge. Now I bid you. Bid doesn't just mean request. It's a command. Now I command you, my beloved hero... The cross is addressing the dreamer as a hero. That you reveal this vision to men. Tell everyone what you've seen. Tell them in words that it is the tree of glory on which Almighty God suffered for mankind's many sins and Adam's ancient deeds. Right? What does that mean? Tell them in words. Preach. Possibility, preach. Louder, Emma. A poem. Tell men in words. And that's what we have. How did the dreamer experience what is happening to him? Through a dream. Dreams aren't necessarily words, right? They're images. Now, they might have words in them. That is, the images in your mind might speak words to you as the dream does, okay? or as the cross does to the dreamer. But it's all visual, really, up here. And so the cross is saying, turn what's up here, it's kind of like professors to students, turn what's up here into that perfect paper that you're going to turn in. Turn it into words. Why? Can anybody else experience his dream? No, they can't. Cross wants others to experience it. So, tell them in words, it is the tree of glory on which Almighty God suffered for mankind's many sins and Adam's ancient deeds. What are Adam's ancient deeds? What St. Augustine... Not the one who brought Roman Christianity to England, but the one who wrote um, The City of God, Confessions, Bishop of Hippo, I can never remember his dates, um, used this term. 
to describe Adam's ancient deeds. Okay? In the eastern part of the church, they never used this term. Ever. It wasn't original sin. Because what, what Augustine meant by that was Adam was the first one, and then it gets passed on biologically, genetically. That sin gets handed down. So Adam screws up, and then everybody after Adam is marked by that sin. Right? The Eastern Church referred to it as ancestral sin. Bear in mind, what does sin mean? It comes from the Greek hamartia. It doesn't mean some great legal judicial faux pas that you've violated some huge, you know, legal thing. It means you missed the mark. What's the mark? Bullseye. That's the mark. To miss the mark means what? You got it there. You got it there. You got it there. <coughs> Notice. You can miss the mark, and you can really miss the mark. Okay. But it all means not perfect. You get a 99 on a test. That's not 100. It's close. Close only counts in what? Horseshoes and hand grenades. Horseshoes and hand grenades. And probably nuclear weapons, you know, <laughs> other things that go boom. Okay? It just means to miss the mark. All right? He says, for mankind's many sins and Adam's ancient deeds. Well, take the biblical story. What was Adam's ancient deed? He ate the fruit, whatever the fruit was. Whether it was an apple, fruit, I don't care what the freaking fruit was. But it was something that was what? Forbidden. Forbidden. It was a simple don't. You can have everything else. This thing, don't. Okay? And Adam said, but I want, you know. Like a four-year-old does. But I want it, Daddy. <laughs> and Daddy said, <laughs> bad. And what happened? Death he tasted there. Now, your translator capitalizes he. Who's it referred to? Usually when you capitalize a pronoun, when it's not the first word in a sentence, it indicates what? Divinity. If I said, you know, Ben was a good student, comma, or semicolon, you know, he got a good grade in the last class, lowercase he, it's probably referring to Ben. Capital he, it's Jesus did well, you know. <laughs> One would hope being, you know, all-knowing. Death he tasted there. See, the he's ambiguous. It could be Christ tasted it where? The cross. cross. Or it could be Adam tasting the apple tasting. For in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. Did Adam take a bite? <laughs> Not according to the biblical story. How did he? <laughs> Spiritual death. Okay. So, yet the Lord rose again with his great might to help mankind. So, if the first he refers to Adam, notice what's being done there in that line. We're getting Adam juxtaposed with Christ. Because Adam died in what? He stayed dead. He didn't come back. Christ died, and according to the Christian story, he rose again. Death he tasted there, but Christ came back and ascended into heaven. And he will come again to this middle earth to seek mankind on doomsday, almighty God. What is this possibly? I say it every morning when I say my prayers, but I can never remember when I talk about it in class. Man, I know um, wake up. Yeah, no. The Nicene Creed. The, what the poet is doing here is he's kind of giving in shortened, um, what's the word? 
almost code-like form, um, a version of or a retelling of the Nicene Creed. Okay. And Wikipedia doesn't give a copy of it. It just describes it. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in his Son, Jesus Christ, etc., etc. And it goes on and talks about Christ doing what? Born of the Virgin Mary, persecuted, dead under Pontius Pilate, was dead, buried, raised again on the third day. Well, what has our poet just done? We've had Mary mentioned. We've had Christ mentioned. He what? He dies. And then he rises again, and he will come again to this middle earth to seek mankind on doomsday. And I believe in the resurrection dead, the judgment of the world to come, etc., etc. The poet is including that in an encapsulated form. Why? Okay, keep in mind, what is going on in this section of the poem? First section was history. This is what happened. And then we get the brief now, where the cross talks about present tense. And then the cross, beginning with this line 95, says... I command you to do what? Go tell about the dream and seemingly everything the cross is telling him now. So when you talk about the dream, do what? Oh yeah, don't forget to mention the Nicene Creed. That is, the creed as it's just called. Okay? We're going to see when we get to Sir Gowan and the Green Knight. Sir Gowan and the Green Knight, he goes off and he's looking for the Green Knight, etc., etc. And one night, Christmas Eve, he's looking for a place to stay. And he says his pater, his ave, and the creed. His pater, his Lord's Prayer, pater nostra, our Father. His ave, that's Hail Mary, full of grace. And his creed, that's this. Okay. So the, the cross says, say all this when you recount the dream. He will come again to this middle earth to seek mankind on doomsday. Who will? Almighty God. Remember, I have the chart up over here. God, man. And we have various terms to describe Christ as Almighty God. And we have various terms to describe him as totally, completely, perfectly human. Why? Why does the poet keep doing this thing, kind of going back and forth? It's because of this. A priest in Alexandria, Egypt, 4th century, early 4th century, named Arius, who came up with what is called the Arian heresy. Okay, And when Arius came up with this idea, he didn't label it. You know, I'm going to label this idea I have as a heresy. I, I want to immediately cut myself off from the rest of the church. No. He thought he was defending the divinity or the otherness, so to speak, of God. He thought he was acting on God's behalf. And what he essentially said was there was a point in time when the second person of the Trinity, the Son, was not. In other words, he didn't believe in the Trinity. The Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Three co-equal persons, one nature, Godhead, all that kind of stuff. He said there was a time when the Son was not. So there, there, there's not really a Trinity. There's God the Father, and then God the Father at some point before time began, kind of hard to wrap our heads around this, said, Behold, this day have I begotten thee. And the Son comes into existence. That was the text, by the way, that Arius based his idea upon. Right? From the Psalms. This day have I begotten thee. Right? And so he said, also the Spirit was created. That is, God, the Father, created Son and Spirit out of the, his godness. Took a little bit of his essence and made a little doll, and that's Jesus, and made another one, and that's the Holy Spirit, essentially. Okay? That's the Arian heresy. It started to spread. I have to spend a little time in church history here. So, in 325, the emperor of the Roman Empire, Constantine the Great, whose mother was Helena, the one who discovered the cross, right? 
he calls for a council. And he calls all the bishops of the church to come to this council. The council is in a town called Nicaea, which is north of, a little bit of, you know, eagle here, Constantinople, the opal named after me, Constantine. Opal is polis, city, right? To this council. And the purpose of the council is not to have a big, wide-ranging discussion and then take a vote as to what is correct Christian doctrine. The purpose of the council is to prove to Arius he's wrong. Okay? So, a bunch of bishops come. How many? 318. Why is 318? Because there's 318. Why is it significant? Because there are 318, quote unquote, fathers mentioned at various points throughout the Old Testament. Okay? We won't go into them. So, these 318 bishops get together, they condemn Her uh, Arius as a heretic, they condemn his ideas as a heresy, okay? Included there, a participant, the real St. Nicholas. And he punched Arius in the face. <laughs> According to proceedings of the council, he walks up to Arius and just decks him. And he's immediately arrested, thrown in prison. Merry Christmas. Right? Yeah, kind of. And then he's released because the emperor has a dream that an angel goes to let him out. <laughs> you know, you don't want to believe that aside. Right? What does all this come down to? The meanings of these two words. The, the Arian heresy. Homo usius and homo. One letter change between these two words. Homo usius. This means, essentially, same <coughs> essence, and this means kind of like um, mostly the same essence, nearly the same essence, okay? Kind of like the difference that Miracle Max points out between being dead, dead, and Mostly dead. He just takes a you know, Miracle Max pill. The council said Christ was the same essence. The Son was the same essence as God. Arius said, not quite. Mostly the same. Almost. He was similar to, etc. Right? So that's one big heresy that flows around. Remember I mentioned the other day, um, I think it was this class, Wolfulus, Bishop of the Goths, okay? He followed this hook, line, and sinker. Now, this heresy spread. That's why they had to have a council. Guess what? There's another council in 351, 381. 381. They have to repeat the same condemnation. Okay? Why? They didn't get it stamped out the first time. The same quote-unquote heresy is around today in some Protestant denominations. Okay? There's another heresy that comes around little bit later, 5th century, I believe, by a British theologian named Pelagius. Okay? This is the Pelagian heresy. How is this one different? Pelagius said, every Tom, Dick, and Harry to get to, can get to heaven without Jesus. You don't need Christ. You just, you, you kind of need, I'm going to jump forward about Oh, what, 1,200 years? Yeah, about 1,200 years. You just kind of need to try to follow what Benjamin Franklin did. If you've ever read the autobiography of Benjamin Franklin, at one point in his life, he undertakes, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm not such a great person. I'm going to be a better person. And if you read the autobiography, what does he do? He kind of takes a ledger approach to life. And he puts, you know, the good things I did today and the bad things I did today. And he starts to realize there's, there's not necessarily more good than there is bad. And when he, he finally stops, because he says, I can't just do this. I can't just decide mentally, rationally, I'm going to, there's, which is why he's a deist, not a quote-unquote, you know, Christian, etc. Pelagius said, you just have to try harder. 
Everybody can, of their own free will, attain heaven. You can follow the law. All right? Well, in the Christian tradition, the whole purpose of Christ is, no, you can't. <laughs> you can't do it. Only someone who's perfect can do it. That's why he's, you know, divine conception, all that kind of stuff. All right. Back to um, Dream of the Root. So, he's going to return. Christ is going to return. We're going to kind of wrap this in in just a moment. Um, he's going to return on doomsday, the Lord himself, with his angels, and he will judge. Why? Because he has the power of judgment. He will judge each one of them as they have earned beforehand in this, and there's that phrase, land of leaf, in this lone life. All right? No one there, where, what's the there? It's not a location. It's a time. No one there, judgment day, may be unafraid at the words which the ruler will speak. What's he going to speak? He's going to ask before the multitude where the man might be who for the Lord's name would taste bitter death as he did earlier on that tree. That is, he's going to ask, did you deny me? Or did you follow me? Did you take up your cross? Did you go along with society? Etc. But they will tremble then. And little think what they might even begin to say to Christ. But call down. It's almost like the speaker throws in. He doesn't. But it's almost like the speaker, whoever, or the, the author, excuse me, has read um, one of the epistles of John where he addresses his reader as little children. Okay? But it's okay. You don't need to be afraid. Judgment Day is going to come, but it's not going to be that bad. Yeah, he's going to ask you a probing question, but no one there need be very afraid. What? He doesn't say, don't worry, it's all going to be fine. Everybody gets to go to heaven. It's not what he says. Everybody who has borne in his breast the best of beacons. Everybody who wears a cross. Now, this speaker, author, obviously is not aware of YouTube and MTV and music videos and an awful lot of people who wear crosses who probably aren't in the group that he's thinking of. Okay, Not being judgmental, I'm just saying, you know. But through the cross shall seek the kingdom, every soul from this earthly way. Notice, he does kind of clarify. It's not just wearing the cross. It's through the cross, seeking God. Whoever thinks to rest with the ruler. Okay, cool. Cross stops speaking. Cross is done. Then I prayed to the tree with a happy heart. I, the dreamer. Does what? He prays to the cross. He doesn't pray to the Christ behind the cross, or above the cross, or beneath it, however you want to put it. He prays to the cross itself. There where I was alone with little company. With little company. Where are, have we seen that before? Earlier in the poem, when he talks about Christ was left behind in his grave. With little company. How little? He was alone. Notice, the wanderer was alone. The seafarer was alone. This speaker is alone. That's like to tease, by the way, the understatement, the severe understatement being left with little company. My spirit longed to start on the journey forth. What journey? The wanderer, possibly? I mean, I always wonder, every time I read this poem, is is or the seafarer i mean because the journey he's talking about is a pilgrimage it's a pilgrimage where ultimately to heaven so my spirit longed to start on the journey forth it has felt so much of longing that sounds like the seafarer it is now my life's hope that i may seek the tree of victory alone more often than all men and honor it well that is not with a group of people this this speaker's like me. He would not be happy with Chaucer Pilgrims. He, he doesn't like parties. Too many people. That's why I moved away from California. It's one of the reasons why I moved away from California. 
So, I wish for that with all my heart. And my hope of protection is fixed on the cross. Well, there are prayers in the early church about all our protection is in the cross. All right? I have few wealthy friends on earth. Lytotes? How few? Zero. Wanderer again? Seafarer? Or is this really each of us? I don't know, you know. Unless you know a millionaire. I, I actually do know a couple millionaires. But probably if I went to him with hat in hand, they'd go, nice hat. <laughs> Put it on your head. That's what it's used for, you know. Make your own money. Little comic. <laughs> I have few wealthy friends on earth. They all have, this is why, they've gone forth. Why doesn't he have any wealthy friends? They're all dead. God, that sounds like the wanderer again. They have gone forth, fled from worldly joys, and sought the king of glory. <coughs> they knew, the speaker is saying, they knew where they were going. They sought somewhere else. They live now in heaven with the high father and dwell in glory. And each day I look forward to the time when the cross of the Lord, on which I've looked while here on this earth, will fetch me from this lone life. I'm waiting. Notice, death is presented as what? The cross. Not the Grim Reaper. Not the, you know, the ghost of Christmas to come in Dickens' Christmas Carol. The guy dressed in black with the rotted, decaying hands, you know. No, it's the cross. Still doesn't mean it's easy, right? Because, you know, remember... <clears throat> that it will fetch me from this lone life and bring me where there is great bliss, joy in heaven. Where the Lord... Lord's host is seated at the feast. What feast? I referred to it the other day, you know, towards the conclusion of the seafair. Wedding feast of the Lamb. With ceaseless bliss. Ceaseless. What's the difference between that bliss and the bliss of the dead warriors, dead pagan Germanic warriors in Valhalla? Yeah. They don't get a party forever. Because eventually... Loki springs his trap, Ragnarok happens, and they all die. Again, <laughs> a real second death, you know, because then they become nothing. And they sent me where I may afterwards dwell in glory, have a share of joy fully with the saints. May the Lord be my friend, he who on earth once suffered on the hanging tree for human sin, now, we've heard several times reference to the cross as a tree. What else do you know about Germanic mythology? There's, there's the tree of life, Yggdrasil, the tree that holds the nine worlds in its boughs. Okay. There's another tree, too. The tree that Odin hung upon for nine days. Why? To gain wisdom. He quote unquote died on that tree. Okay? Now, some mythologers, studiers of mythology, have argued that Germanic mythology might ultimately be based in Christian mythology. And just gotten a lot of it, quote-unquote, wrong. That is, they got really poorly Xeroxed copies of the Christian story. Had gaps and stuff, and what did they do? They filled in the gaps. Okay? I don't know whether that's true or not. I've read some of the stuff that says that. I, some of it kind of, you know, makes pretty good sense. But, he who once, here on earth, once suffered on the hanging tree for human sin. He ransomed us, gave us life, a heavenly home. Hope was renewed with cheer and bliss for those who were burning there. Burning where? Hell. Germanic conception of hell. Cold, snowy, Minneapolis yesterday. <laughs> 65 below zero, you know. So what did he do? The sun was successful in that journey, 
mighty and victorious, when he came with a multitude, a great host of souls, into God's kingdom. I don't know. This is what is called the harrowing of hell. In some versions of the creed, we're told Christ dead was buried, he descended into hell, and on the third day he rose again. Well, why did he descend into hell? Was there some impurity he had to get burnt off? No. He was freeing what souls in hell? From Adam until Christ. All of them? Did everybody from Adam till Christ get, you know, uh, uh, community chest, chance card, goes directly to go, past the jail? Did, he, did they get that? Mm, according to some of the early church fathers, yes. Think of hell as this classroom. I know, it's really neat for some of you. Think of hell as this classroom. And what Christ did, he opened the door and it didn't close. <laughs> he goes down to hell and I like the way Dante puts it or, or describes it. He doesn't just, hello, anybody want to come with me up to heaven? You look like a believer. Sorry, you're dead. Uh, according, to, according to Calvin, you're saved. Yeah, and the rest you go to hell. <laughs> Is that what he's talking about? According to many of the early church fathers, the descent into hell was Christ going down to hell, he breaks open the gates of hell, and they stay open from that point on. So think of the worst prison you can think of. I'm from San Jose, California, Alcatraz, not too far away. And there's no gates, no cell doors. So after that point, according to some of the church fathers, everybody who is in hell are people who want to be in hell. Simply because they don't want to serve. They don't want to bow down, etc. So, he goes down. And why is he victorious? Because an awful lot of people do want to come back. An awful, awful lot of people do want to change or turn. Or an awful lot of souls in hell recognize Christ's <laughs> word, who he says he is, you know, in the Christian tradition. So, he comes with a multitude, great host of souls into God's kingdom, the one ruler almighty, the angels rejoicing that is way to go, Jesus, you know. And all the saints already in heaven dwelling in glory when Almighty God, their ruler, returned to his rightful throne. Notice, Almighty God. It's kind of like he leaves and somebody else is placed in charge temporarily. Michael Gabriel. Okay? So, back to all this. Who might the audience of the poem be? <clears throat> Bear in mind, it survives in an artifact, the Rival Cross, that dates from around 700, 725. And then it survives in a manuscript dated 975 to 1025. Now, some have suggested that the inscription on the cross might have been added later. That is, the cross was raised, and then somebody came and said, hey, look, let's put... <laughs> and then carves the inscription. Possible. Most scholars think, no, it's, it's contemporaneous with the raising of the cross, and that's sometime around 700 A.D. Well, 700 A.D. is how close to when St. Augustine brought Roman Christianity. It's just about 100 years. Where is it? St. Augustine, if you think of a map of England, St. Augustine comes way down here, Canterbury. Where is Dumfries? Scotland. Way up here. Okay. Now there's Celtic Christianity <coughs> up north of that a little bit. But we know from Bede, who writes ecclesiastical history in 731, okay, about the same time as the poem. We know from Bede. That, you know, Christianity didn't land here and people started tweeting about it. It spread like wildfire. It took a while. I mean, yeah, first few years there were mass conversions and such. But we know that even as late as the 8th century, mid to late 8th century, there were pockets of quote-unquote holdouts. 
I don't want to be a Christian. You guys are a bunch of sissies. You believe in a God who dies for you. How good of a leader dies? I mean, what would Trump say? Leaders don't die. I mean, what was the thing about John McCain? You got captured. I like heroes who don't get captured. Idiot. <laughs> okay? But here's, you know, this one does. So why might, why might the poet include this? Well, the audience might be mostly pagan, formerly recently pagan. That is, they might be newly baptized. In fact, this might even be part of the baptism catechization process. This might be part of the way of spreading the good news. Kind of like, you know, Christian recording... Well, I shouldn't go there because I absolutely detest it. Christian recording artists, you know, use music, etc. Today, okay? Well, this is the music, etc. of the day. But notice what he's doing. The speaker is making sure he's got his doctrinal I's dotted, T's crossed, minding the P's and Q's. Everything is theologically correct. There's, there's nothing, quote-unquote, according to the teaching, at least, of the early church, there's nothing theologically wrong or suspect here. There are no, well, this guy's kind of leaning a little bit over to the, hmm. it's all theologically perfect, so to speak. Okay? Now the next poem that we do, there's a little bit more questions about, let's say, Beowulf. That is, one reason there are some questions about it is Beowulf is such a long poem, and there is so little overt Christianity in the poem. In fact, that was a perfect example of Lightetes. There is no overt Christianity in Beowulf. You don't see Jesus mentioned. You don't see Mary mentioned. You don't get mention of the Bible. You don't get mention of any apostles. You don't get mention of any doctrine. Okay? You do have a story from the Bible mentioned. It's Old Testament. Really, 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 really early Old Testament. Like first ten chapters of Genesis early. Okay? But you have allusions. Cryptic allusions to various other passages that I would argue in the preponderance of old English scholars argue shows the poet was definitely Christian. Okay, Whether the poet was using his or her Christianity to try to, you know, spread a message, allegorize, something like that, that's that's open to debate. I mean, there are there are scholars of Beowulf. Excuse me, were scholars of Beowulf because there aren't really any more around that say this that read Beowulf totally as allegory. X stood for Y, Z stood for A, etc. Kind of a thing. Okay, um, nobody does that today. Nobody because it it just it doesn't work. Okay, so let's start talking about. Beowulf. First of all, um, how many of you have read Beowulf? The whole thing. Beginning to end. All of it. Okay. How Do you know what translation you used? Uh, off the top of my head, it was senior high school. Senior high school, probably AP English. Yes. Sir. Okay. More than likely, you used either... Actually, you guys probably didn't because you were young enough. Probably were young. Burton Raffles translation slash adaptation. E. Talbot <coughs> Donaldson's prose translation. Or many, if not most of you, probably used Shan Seamus Haney's translation. Okay? Who, anybody know who Seamus Haney is? Irish poet. Irish poet. What else? How good of a poet? Nobel Prize winning poet. I mean, if you're a Nobel Prize winner, usually 
That means you're pretty good. There have been an awful lot of people who win Nobel Prizes. They're just crap writers. Okay, I'm just my own judgment. Not Haney. Haney's a fantastic poet. Right? But when Haney's translation came out, a lot of us in the Anglo-Saxon scholarly community, I was on the old English international listserv at, at this point. I got off it a couple of years ago because it's gone all wacko. Um, we came up with a nickname. We, affectionately or not so, referred to his translation as Heaney. <laughs> Why? Some stuff Seamus Haney does with the Beowulf translation is fantastic. But some of it's just really, really bad. Like freshman English bad. Worse than freshman English. High school English bad. Okay? But it's, it, it's bad for an understandable reason. He's trying to capture the spirit of the poem, right? Which he does fairly well. He's just not very accurate. And those of you who had me before, if there's anything that, about me that should come out, it's I'm pretty much a purist when it comes to you know translations, adaptations from book to film, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I understand, you know, you, you adapt a book to a film, you got to cut some stuff out. Why? Because this sucker is 3,182 lines. You cannot reduce this to a two and a half, three hour film. Can't be done. People have tried. Horribly. Horribly they've tried. The poem is written, in my opinion, written to be made into a film. Whoever wrote this, this person had a cinematic eye. It could be done. Easily, but it's like suddenly screenwriters look at it and go, well, what an idiot. I could do better than that, and they can't. Um, so what's an example? Early on in the poem, he uses the verb tholed. What does tholed mean? Yeah, that's what I thought. Why? Why do none of you know this simple modern English word? Because it's not a simple modern English word. It is a modern English dialectal word that survives only in Ulster English. That is, the dialect of Ulster, Ireland, where he was from. Like 500,000 speakers out of, I don't know, 4 billion speakers of English. And only 500,000 of them understand it, right? Here's what's really important. He translates the Old English word, folded. The Old English word, the verb that, the root or the infinitive form of the verb, folian. The Ulster dialectal form is a derivative of the Old English word. It means to suffer or endure. That's not a good translation. <laughs> For Haney, it works, because he understands it perfectly. If you've been raised in Ulster, Ireland, with the problems, the problems, you know, between the Catholics and the Irish, you know, if you're Irish, it's like the Catholics are Grindle. If you're Catholic, it's like the Protestants are Grindle. So there's Grindles running, you know, all around. So that's just, you know, a little background. Now, Leus' translation, I think, is one of the very best. It is, one, it's in verse. I think it's important to try to capture that. Two, it gets the spirit. And I think in terms of accuracy, it's really, really good. But as with The Wanderer, I'm going to take apart passages. People always, uh, students always ask me when they find out what my interests are, well, what do you think of Tolkien's translation? Because I teach A Course in J.R.R. Tolkien, you know, all that kind of stuff. It's horrible. <laughs> Why? because it's archaic. It's really old-fashioned. He's translating from late 1920s up through the 1950s. I mean, his translation was for his use in his lectures and such. But it's like from the English language 70 years before. And Tolkien does that for a reason. The Beowulf manuscript, the language of Beowulf that we have, is archaic Old English. When whoever copies it or writes the poem that we now have writes it, 
it's intentionally written using an older form of the language. Kind of like what the translators do in 1611 with the King James Version of the Bible. People didn't say, my cup runneth over in 1611 England. They would say, my cup runs over, or my cup is filled, or is full. Okay? Cup runneth over, that's about 100 years out of date kind of language. Right? So, more, let's, let's go back. Let's go back to the beginning. Beowulf survives in one of those four major poetic codices. It's called, for its shelf mark, is British Library, Cotton Vitellius A15. It's V-I-T-E-L-L-I-U-S, right? And it's cotton because it belonged to a man named Sir Robert Bruce Cotton, B-R-U-C-E. So Robert Bruce Cotton, who was an antiquarian, he was a collector, right? He collected a lot of manuscripts. He collected a lot of manuscripts that us medievalists are very thankful that he collected, because if he hadn't, they would probably be gone, and we would know nothing of the poems and stories that those manuscripts contain. For example, Beowulf. This is the only copy of the poem that exists. As far as we know, it's the only copy that ever existed. Now, there are scholars who argue that what we have is a copy of a copy, which was a copy of a copy, which was a copy of a copy, and that the original poem was composed sometime, possibly, 7th, very early 8th century. 700 to 825, say. Okay? The manuscript, however, like all four of the Old English major poetic codices, dates from roughly 975 to 1025. So some scholars argue that the poem, the poem was created here, and the copy that we have now was copied there. So notice that's about two to three hundred years difference, possibly, from when it was created to the version that we have now. We'll come back to that in a moment. So Robert Bruce Cott, he was a collector. Well, because he was a collector, he had a library of manuscripts and books. Here's how he organized it. Right? Because if you have a whole bunch of books, you need a way to organize it. You don't want your library to look like my office, for those of you who have been in my office, where it's seemingly haphazard and scattered. But I can pretty much, you know, if somebody you know knows a book they're looking for, I have a pretty good idea of where everything is. Okay? Think of these panels over here. Think of this as a bookcase. Here's a bookcase. There's a bookcase. Bookcase, bookcase, bookcase. Right? So he had these around the walls in his library. And on top of each panel, you're a little tall, on top of each panel, he had a bust of a Roman emperor. So a little statue, but just bust of a Roman emperor. Okay? A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, da, 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 da. no J. This particular manuscript was in the book, what's called book press, they didn't call them book, book cases, was in the book press that had the Roman Emperor Vitellius on top. Okay? A15. A refers to shelf. A, B, C, D, E, F, etc. 15, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So, if you were looking for Cotton Vitellius A15, you go find the bust with Vitellius. You go to the first shelf, 15th item over, and that's this manuscript. Okay? Sir so Gown of the Green Knight, that we'll do next. Well, not quite next. We'll do it in several weeks. <laughs> um, is Cotton 
him Nero A. 10. So, find the book prints with Nero on it. Not a good idea. I mean, what's Nero famous for? Rome burnt while Nero what? Supposedly fiddled. Right? Go to Nero A, 10 items in, and that's the manuscript that contains Sir Gowan and the Green Knight. Right? 1731, this library caught fire. And it's called Ashburnham House. And what people did, they ran into the library, they ran into the building, the building caught fire. They ran into the building and they just grabbed manuscripts by the armload and chucked them out the window. Well, out the window on one side was the Thames. Okay, so some of them were destroyed, some of them stopped burning, washed up on the bank and stuff. But if you look at Beowulf, if you look at this picture of Beowulf, notice, this is the opening page of the manuscript. Notice, and I'm going to put some links up on D2L because I've got some really good stuff. Um, this side of the manuscript, not, not the whole dark image, but right there, it's all nice and straight. But this side's all ratty and torn. Why? What part of the book is this part? Other side. This part is this. If you were to have a big old bonfire, and I don't mean a little fire. I mean a big old 20-foot bonfire right outside Peck Hall. Actually, do it on Peck Hall. <laughs> <laughs> Burn the whole damn thing. <laughs> and you were to throw this book on it. Would it burn? Yeah, part of it would. Why would the outside part burn? It's exposed. There's oxygen there. Is there any oxygen right here between these leaves? No, there's not. Okay. So the manuscript got damaged. Okay. As did a bunch of others. Some of them got damaged in uh, in terms of their now charcoal. I mean, literally, lumps of charcoal. But whoever the masters of the British Library were at the time, um, or when Cotton's Library got donated, they kept the charcoal. Because now we have technology that can scan those lumps of charcoal and pick out individual leaves and individual letters. That technology has actually been used on papyrus scrolls, papyrus scrolls from the ancient library of Her Herculaneum, which was destroyed when Mount Vesuvius erupted. A whole bunch of, of materials were discovered in the last hundred years when the library was discovered. And we can now decipher what is in these scrolls. Even though they're not unrolled, they're not open up. You look at them, and it looks like something you throw on a grill to start a fire. Okay? But they're all full of stuff. In fact, some of the things that have been deciphered have been, quote-unquote, lost works. Not complete, okay, but pieces. So when we get to Beowulf, you're going to see you know, some lines. You're going to have words like that that are going to be in... Uh, brackets. Why? Reconstructed. Not quite sure that that's really what's there. Now fortunately, in the 1780s the manuscript was copied. It was transcribed. Right? Twice. Twice. <laughs> hard to do when you're holding it. Okay. Um, one of the copyists copied it in modern English orthography handwriting. The other copyist copied the exact same letter forms that are in the manuscript. That is, that copy is kind of like trying to produce a Xerox. Okay? Which is really good, because from what we know, that copyist didn't know Anglo-Saxon at all. So, that copyist was not attempting to fill in the blanks. He was attempting solely to copy everything he saw. And because of that, we know but some of the words are at the ends of lines that no longer are there. Why? 
outside of the manuscript got brittle. Fires in 1731, over the next 200 odd years, it starts to break away a little bit. So now when you see this, this is a paper frame that this is now essentially glued into. Okay. Those of you who are rich, there's a big Anglo-Saxon, um, uh, what is it, exhibition going on at the British Library in London now through February 19th. Over, what is it, I think over 600 items will be on display. Field trip. Yeah, field trip. Yeah, I'm sure the dean would, <laughs> and McPhee would go along with that. Um, okay. Beowulf also contains other material, that it's not just Beowulf. It has yeah, four other works in it. It's got, um, it begins with prose works, Life of St. Christopher, Wonders of the East, Letter of Alexander to Aristotle. And then you have Beowulf, and the last thing in the manuscript is Judith. Okay. Judith is a Jewish heroine okay. um, from an apocryphal book of the Old Testament. That is a, a book that's not usually taken to be um, canonical. So, Life of St. Christopher. What did anybody know anything about St. Christopher? What's his name mean? The Ophir means bearer of Christ, bearer of Christ. Why? Because the legend of St. Christopher, the life of St. Christopher, is that he was a giant who kind of thought people were going across streams and stuff, and he carries Christ on his shoulder across the streams. That's why if you see a St. Christopher medal, it's a picture of a big guy with a child on his shoulder. Okay? One of the stories of St. Christopher um, was that he was a dog-headed man. So body, earth, no. <laughs> and meets Christ, and he gets transformed into everyday ordinary person. Now, why this? Why is that important? Well, Beowulf obviously has monsters, right? Who are they? Grindle, Grindle and his mom. His mother. What else? Dragon, usually a monster. I don't know. People are kind of weird to. Oh, I want to be a dragon. You know, a bunch of freaky head pages. Um, <laughs> St. Christopher, dog-headed man, I think most of us would say, normal? <laughs> no. That's kind of monstrous. Wonders of the East? Wonders of the East is a book about, or a story about, somebody who's traveled to the eastern part of the world and seen all kinds of strange things. For example, things that show up in C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia. You have, for example, in, what is it, Voyage of the Dawn Treader. They meet duffel puns. Beings with one leg. Those are in Voyage of the East. You have people, if I remember correctly, whose heads are down there and their feet are up here. I don't understand how that works, but, right? In other words, oddities, more monsters. <coughs> Letter of Alexander to Aristotle is a supposed letter, it's not real, is a supposed letter from Alexander to his tutor Aristotle about all the cool things he's seen on his eastern campaigns off into India and such. Because of that, the manuscript has been called a Liber book monstrorum, a book of monsters. We've got monsters in this. What about Judith? Any monsters in Judith? Any of you know the Judith myth or story? I just have a question. Yeah. So all of those works are in Cotton Battalion. All those works are in Cotton Battalion, 815. Okay. It's also called the Townley Manuscript by a guy who owned it. Okay? All these are in that manuscript. Beowulf, Beowulf is part of it. Well, Judith is a story about a woman who kills a man. The man's name... Is Holofernes or hollow ferns, as some people call them. Holofernes. Why does Judith kill him? Is she some rabid proto feminist? No. He tries to rape her. Pretty good reason. Okay? So she kills him. She becomes a hero for the Jewish people. 
Now, to some, that in and of itself would be monstrous. Women shouldn't kill men. If anything, it should be the other way around. That's how God, you know. Uh, it's one of the characters in one of Chaucer's tales. One of the character, yeah, in one of Chaucer's tales, not character recounting the tale. Would kind of go along with that. In the wife of Bath's tale, one of the wife of Bath's husbands would be totally in line with that way of thinking. Women, you know, if there's going to be any murder going on, it's men murdering women. It, it, it's the natural order of things, according to this one character. Okay, so she kills him. But for some, that would be monstrous. Or how about the fact that he's a rapist? Because that's not normal either. Or it shouldn't be, let's say. You never know. Okay? So, monsters. One of the best scholars of Beowulf is a guy named Andy Orchard. I have no idea where he is anymore. When I first started, he's about my age, might be a couple years younger. Um, when I first started out as a professor, I think he was at Cambridge in the Department of Celtic, Anglo-Saxon, Old Norse, and Old English. Which, if any of you, you know, want to do medieval stuff, you know, uh, literature, if you want to go into graduate school, that would be your goal. That would be the best department in the world. I mean, for me at least. Because it covers every, I mean, they've got people to cover all aspects of medieval literature. Anyways, he's written a couple of books on Beowulf. This first one was called Pride and Prodigies. Okay. And it's largely about the monsters of Beowulf. And then he's written a second one called A Critical Companion to Beowulf. A little more boring sounding. Which is just talking about critical issues, kind of a critical understanding or reading of Beowulf. So if you get interested in Beowulf or writing a paper about Beowulf, you want to get to the library and get these before anybody else does. All right. Um, let's go about this again, just briefly. I told you we'd be behind. <laughs> Date of composition. Now, as I said, there are some who argue, and some, I don't, I don't mean crackpots, I mean some really top notch scholars who argue that Beowulf. As it was originally orally composed, that is, composed in some singer's mind, okay, goes back to probably the 7th to 8th centuries, okay, 600 to, you know, 725, something like that. And then it gets orally told, and at some point in time, somebody makes a copy of it. And then that gets copied, and that gets copied, and that gets copied, and that gets copied, etc. Until we get to the one we have. Okay? So, date of composition, date of the, co of the one that we have. And then there are scholars who will argue for almost any time in between this period and this period for a date of composition. There are people who argue for the early 9th century. 800 to about 850. And they've got some good reasons for doing it. Um, for example, there was an Anglo-Saxon king with the name Bairnwolf. That's pretty damn close. <laughs> Take that in off, you know, and you'd, and R, and you'd have Beowulf, etc. One Anglo-Saxon scholar, um, now since retired, but he's still involved, University of Louisville up in Kentucky, his name is Kevin Kiernan. He argued at first in a paper in 1979-1980, and then in a book, and then he revised it in a book, he still holds to this, that the manuscript that we have, the manuscript version that we have, is the only version of the poem that we have. That ever existed. Okay. I'm, I'm being real particular about my language. The version that we have is the only one of that version that ever existed. In fact, he argues that the poet who created that is one of the two copyists of the poem in the manuscript. All right. So it's what, partially at least, 
It's what's called holograph, handwritten copy, right? But he argues that poet is working from, or that copyist, is working from other stories, plural, of Beowulf. Because Beowulf essentially has, the, the tale essentially has what? What does it really tell us? What do we see the beginning over half? Beowulf fights whom? Grindel? Grindel's mother. And then what happens? Does he immediately go fight the dragon? He fights Grindel, he fights Grindel's mother, he goes back home, and then what does the poet, the narrator say? Fifty years go by. That is, and now Beowulf has ruled for fifty years. He goes from being just a Grindel killer to now he's ruled the Geats for fifty years, and the dragon comes. Tolkien calls this the rising and falling of a great hero. We see two halves of a life: the rising, the falling. Notice we don't see what. We don't see the in-between. We don't see Beowulf middle-aged, so to speak. Right? Now, Kiernan's argument is that's because the person who writes this in the manuscript we have has found two totally, essentially different stories. And he joins them together. Now, the only thing that's similar about them is they're both about Beowulf. But that prior to the manuscript we have, nobody else who had heard the tale of Grindel and Grindel's mother heard Paul Harvey's the rest of the story about what happened to Beowulf. Or possibly those who heard the part about the dragon didn't know about Beowulf's earlier life. This is where we get all that kind of wrapped up, put together. Now, some early scholars actually said, I mean, 19th century scholars, some early scholars said, you know what, we have more than just those two stories. He said, we got a whole bunch of stories in here. This is called the leader carry. This means songs or lays, theory. That is, Beowulf is composed, created out of a whole bunch of stories that somebody stitches together. Sorry. Right. And what scholars following this guy said was, okay, where are the stitches? Show me. And he did. I mean, Ed Muller kind of said, okay, here, 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 here. But nobody, almost nobody agrees with this. But there is something in the poem that might suggest, okay, maybe there's a kernel of truth here, and maybe there's a kernel of truth here. Right? So why is all this important? I mean, who gives a rat you know what for... When the poem was composed versus for, you know, when it was copied in manuscript. Here's why it's important. Remember the Anglo-Saxon history that we've gone over kind of ad nauseum? What starts happening in the late 8th century? 780s, 790s? Who starts coming in? What are they also called? The Viking invasions. Okay, so big deal. The Vikings come. Who cares? Who is the poem Beowulf about? It's written in Old English, but it's not about Anglo-Saxons. It's not said in England. He's Danish, isn't he? He's Gaelish, if you want, or Gaelish, if you want. Okay, but uh, it's set. Hrothgar is a Dane. Yeah. The first part of it is set in Denmark. The second part of it is set in the land of the Geats. Okay, a little bit of it is set in the Rhineland. You know. So it's Scandinavian or Scandinavia, Denmark, Sweden, that area, northern Germany. That's where the entirety of the poem is set. But it's Old English. 
So if the poem was begun, if the poem was first created, let's just say 700, orally. And so you have a shope singing about it. And how are Hrothgar and his cronies being described? He's the victory king. They are spear Danes. They're shield Danes. They're victory Danes. He's a ring. These guys are warriors. It's praising them. Maybe. We'll talk about that. Okay? And they're what? They're Danes. Ancestors of the Vikings. And then beginning around 790, the Vikings start raping, robbing, robbing and pillaging your country. And people are going to go on and keep singing and copying this poem, celebrating the ancestors of your current rapists and pillagers and robbers. <coughs> See, one of the arguments against an early date is thematically, it'd be kind of hard to stand up in some chieftain's hall and go, yes, let's now sing of the glory days of, wait a second, those who are killing, robbing, robbing raping, and pillaging us. Hmm. Okay. What else? What's another aspect, possibly, for an early date of the poem? I mentioned it right at the beginning. There's very little what in the poem. Christianity. Christianity. In fact, people have written books on the paganism of Beowulf. The only problem with those books is it's kind of hard to pinpoint actual paganism in Beowulf. Just as Christ... Mary, the apostles, the Bible, etc., aren't mentioned. Neither is Odin, or Thor, or Freya, or, Fr or Tyr. It, it's not like, you know, we have some rabid secularist. I'm going to write a completely non-religious text. Can't we all just get along, except for I want what you have, and I'm going to take it. <clears throat> no. So where is the paganism? <clears throat> oh, well, we have... References to method and weird. Method just means measure. <coughs> Measurer. It often gets translated God. Weird sometimes, not often, sometimes gets translated God. Now, I think this is an accurate translation. This is wrong. <laughs> this is biased. This is trying to say, hey, let's just let's just take that old idea we don't want to have to wrestle with and Jesusify it. Let's just make it nice and easy on the easy on the palate. Okay. So what about a late date? Well, is there any Christianity in the poem? Not overtly, but there might be a reference to. Beowulf's mother being like Mary. Just like the poet of the wanderer, uh, the dream of the root says. We're going to hear Beowulf's mother praised as being kind of blessed and most famous among women. Maybe it's just because I'm a Christian, but I don't think so, because I know scholars who aren't Christian go, yeah, it's pretty clearly, that's, that's an illusion. They don't like it, but that's an illusion to Mary. I mean, okay. Beowulf goes down into the mirror after Grendel's mother, and they start to see blood and gore well up, and we're told at the lone dais, the ninth hour. Well, go back and reread your Gospels. What happens on the ninth hour? Christ dies. At that moment in the poem, Hrothgar and all those people go, Look at all that blood coming up from the lake. And I think he's a goner. And they leave. Okay? There are multiple little things like that. And then there are other you know, kind of more significant thematic ones that we'll talk about also. Um, yeah, we've got five minutes. Let's go ahead and start. So, what way Gardena in Yeradagun? Sead kinninga thrim yafrun. Who is athalingus? That's the opening few lines just from the bit of the manuscript that you can see. What? Listen. Or, yo, you know. 
We've heard of the glory in bygone days of the folk kings of the spear days, how those noble lords did lofty deeds. Notice the verb tenses. They're past tense in all of that opening passage. We have heard, okay, heard, past tense, but the had indicates, and we still do hear about it. In other words, we're still hearing tales about these dead guys. Of the glory in bygone days, in Yair Dagum. Yair Dagum. We still have this today. It's very archaic. We don't say Yair. What, what word do we have? Very archaic, old-fashioned word. Starts with a ya, has er in it. Vowel before, nothing at the end. Your, in days of your. That's literally what that means. In other words, it's kind of like once upon a time. What's the poet telling us? This is a fairy tale, folks. We are in a fantasy. We have heard once upon a time of the glory of what? The folk kings of the Spear Danes. That is, the kings of the people of the Spear Danes. How they what? How those noble lords <coughs> did lofty deeds. Remember the line in the uh, seafarer. lines in the sea, seafarer where the seafarer talked about the kings and Caesars of old and said what about them compared to the kings and Caesars we have now he said now we have worse sir right it's almost like the poet is setting us up man imagine what it must have been like to be back in these days when there were real Heroes. Often, and what's the poet doing? We're going back in time. Okay? You guys are all too young to have ever listened to any of this, but get on the internet, get on internet radio, and do a search for old time radio and pull up just one sound file, I don't care, any one, of the Lone Ranger, and listen to the beginning, the very beginning, and you'll talk, you'll hear talk about the thrilling hoofbeats of the great horse Silver, and it says something about yesteryear. In other words, this is a story of kind of heroic action, action from days in the past. Often, shield shoving Seize the mead benches from many tribes. Troops of enemies struck fear into earls. Do we know who Shield Shevin is at this point? No. no idea. All we have is his name. Can we deduce anything from his name? Yeah, we can. His name, Shield, is the word from which we get. Shield. shield. Change the word. Uh, vowel. Thank you. Shield. Shevin. Leave the I and G alone. I heard it. Sheaf. Sheaf. Like a sheaf of wheat. And A means son or descendant of. So, early English scholars said, huh, shield, son of sheaf, has to be some kind of fertility god. Because a sheaf, like a sheaf of wheat, sheaf of corn, etc. No, it doesn't. In fact, we have the same name. In Old Norse sources, Danish sources, because shield is skjold in the ing, the skjoldums. Real dynasty. Real people. Shield himself, however, appears to be mythological or literary. Okay, we'll stop there. So we are, let's see, today's, oh, look, we're ahead. Right? Or is today the 31st? No, nope, the 31st. Yeah, so we're only about 785 lines behind. <laughs> we'll probably double that by the end of next class.